Hello and welcome to the Commonweal Policy Podcast. I'm Craig DL. I'm the Head of Policy and Research at Commonweal. And this week, my special guest is Professor Richard Murphy from Tax Research UK, uh, economist, uh, accountant and co-author of the, the original 2008 proposal that coined the term Green New Deal. Uh, I mentioned that for reasons that will become apparent as we go through this podcast. Uh, Richard, welcome back. It's really good to see you again. How have you been? I'm very well, thank you. Um, surviving the uh, world that we live in. Um, not desperately optimistic, unlike somebody who stood up and gave a Chancellor's speech today. But nonetheless, buoyant and pleased to be here. And that is precisely why I want to, wanted you on the podcast this week, because we have two events that we wanted to, to discuss this week. Uh, the first being the, the UK Spending Review, which is the, the which happens every three years in the UK uh, and is, is somewhat bigger than the annual budget that comes out once or twice a year. Um, although you often hear the same kind of noises in both. So we want to talk about that and then we want to look forward to the big event coming up over the next couple of weeks, which is COP26 in Glasgow and the, the opportunities or perhaps the opportunities missed that we'll see over there. So let's start with a spending review. Um, this was a slightly strange one in that there were a lot of leaks in the days and weeks running up to this, uh, to the point where the Speaker of the House uh, admonished Rishi Sunak, saying that in normal circumstances, one of his, any of his predecessors would have resigned over the, the, the state of the leaks. Were you surprised at this? Uh, is this something that you can, uh, is this, why did this happen? Was this them trying to get the good news out or try to get the bad news out early? To, to well, I think the there's two reasons why. One is we have an incredibly ambitious chancellor who uh, appears to have no limits to the size of his ego. Um, and that is Rishi Sunak. I mean, we face the fact that there is brand Sunak now. This man is already running his Tory party leadership campaign bid uh, from within number 11 at present. So he has been trying to make clear that it is he who is running the agenda and not number 10. They've been issuing a lot of pre-release press releases, uh, frankly, an overwhelming number of pre-release press releases so that there was almost a new announcement every hour over the weekend. This was unprecedented. It has not happened before. Um, I was actually uh, speaking at lunchtime on the BBC and Lucy Fraser, who is the number three minister in the Treasury, was there. And she tried to claim that this was normal. It is anything but. Mm -hmm. So, and, and indeed, the deputy speaker who opened the proceedings today actually said to Rishi Sunak, would you like to now deliver the rest of your budget? Um, which you know, was a slap down if ever there was one. Um, so very strange indeed. Um, what was really weird was that he actually had had all the good news in advance. There was very little else left to say today. Mm. And there was also a bit of an imbalance in that we had all this news that came out in the in the press, but there's a, a photo going around of one of the, the, the MPs, one of the opposition MPs in the House of Commons with their official pre-release of the, the, the statement, and it's just a sea of redacted black. <laughs> so a severe power imbalance going on there as well. Well, this is normal. I mean, there is always a challenge at the budget for whoever's got to reply on behalf of the opposition uh, because they simply do not get enough information in advance. I have great sympathy. Um, for the last decade, I have actually done the budget commentary on BBC Radio 2, um, listening to the speech, then being expected to provide expert comment in, from half past one until two o'clock, um, having never read a single document that they have issued. Um, now, actually, in that sense, Rishi Sunak helped me this year, but we are still talking about what happened on the day. So I've always had to think on my feet. So does the whoever answers for the opposition today, Rachel Reeves. Um, they do not get um, the information. There is a power imbalance. It is deliberate. Um, but that's the game of politics. Yeah, and it's interesting that you also see the game of politics in, within the Tory party as well. You, you, you describe this as uh, almost Sunak's leadership bid, um, where you definitely get a sense of, a, of different, different budget philosophies between Rishi Sunak, who is much more fiscally conservative, uh, albeit 
this has been a budget that has had some some push towards uh, relaxing some of the austerity of the past. Um, but you counterpoint that with Boris Johnson and, and his his levelling up agenda, uh, which will involve a lot of in infrastructure spending, uh, whether you believe it will ever happen or not. Well, today was, I mean, if we stand back, which is what I prefer to do when I look at a budget. I mean, there's lots of detailed announcements in here and some of them we can talk about. Some of them are deeply offensive to Scotland. There were digs throughout, for example, against the whole of the devolution settlement, not just in Scotland, but in Wales and Northern Ireland as well. There were digs against, you know, Holyrood's ability to deliver for cities in Scotland. We were clearly seeing a very large amount of what was called, you know, pork barrel um, politics here. If your constituency votes Tory, you're likely to do quite well out of today. And if it didn't, well, bad luck on you. Um, so we can see all that. But let's stand back for a moment and just actually look at what happened. We did expect there to be a real conflict between Sunak and Johnson. I have to say, I didn't see as much of that today as I expected. Now, the announcements made, I frankly never believe the numbers that are said, because as we have seen, for example, with regard to the announcements on spending on transport in, in cities in England, and I think actually not in Scotland in this case, um, you know, the numbers are pre, pre announced, there were tiny changes. So you can never trust a number that comes out of a chancellor's mouth. And I have to say that's been previous ones. But the critical point today was that so much of his comparison was with 2010. Now, that's really weird, because, of course, what he was comparing himself with was this is the best since 2010. In other words, the Labour government had done really quite well to 2010, which is what he's saying he's trying to get back to. And he was basically using his speech to say George Osborne got it wrong. Philip Hammond got it wrong. Um, I, I such a job it wasn't there for long enough to make an impact. But the point is, he was trying to say that the two previous administrations, whether it was Cameron's or May's, were completely wrong to run austerity. And he's trying to protect, uh, pretend he's doing something completely different. Very strange indeed. Never heard a chancellor, frankly, be so abusive to former chancellors from his own side before. And yet that's what we got. In contrast with what frankly Osborne and Hammond were like, neither of them particularly inspiring or I would say optimistic men, um, Rishi Sunak gave us boosterism without limit. Um, it's as though he has caught that complaint from next door from uh, Boris Johnson. I've been through the numbers uh, this afternoon. I mean, I actually enjoy reading budget documents. You know, please, you know, send Both help. Of us. <laughs> Both of us. Probably no one else. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> there are two sad people, maybe a few more in the country. But the point is, I do like reading these things because they tell you what they think the narrative is. And here, they are the most extraordinarily and deeply inconsistent assumptions about the fact we're going to see a lot of growth. It has come in the last couple of years from government spending it's now going to completely cease to be from government spending apparently business investment is going to drive growth households in the uk as a whole are going to suddenly go out and spend 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 like there's been no tomorrow there's going to be no net savings by households over the next five years in fact there's going to be net borrowing by households over the next five years that has never happened in uk history before that for as long as we've got data anyway um reliable data so completely unprecedented um unprecedented levels apparently of business investment driven by the tax relief which is only available now for another couple of years at most so not going to explain why it's all going to go on you know, it's just utterly pie in the sky boosterism optimism um people are going to get wage rises ahead of inflation uh with no explanation as to why great if true i'd love it but i frankly am I'm not at all convinced. So, so many weird assumptions that I can't make stack in here. There simply isn't a reason to believe that the growth that underpins his thinking is going to happen. And that's the basis of his claim, the critical claim to any Tory, the thing that will keep his backbenchers happy, which is that the amount of the national debt will fall in proportion to national income. He has to keep his backbenchers happy because he's set himself up with this you know, disastrous idea that national debt is such a terrible thing that he must always promise that he'll reduce 
if not the total amount of the national debt, and by the way, he won't be doing that, it will actually go up in absolute terms every year. And again, it was quite amusing to hear Lucy Fraser make a complete twit of herself at lunchtime in my presence, um, saying, no, the national debt's going to go down, not realising that, in fact, she was only referring to it as a percentage of supposed growth in national income, um, which I could then correct live on Radio 2, which I enjoyed, I fully admit. Um, but... Um, so it is going to go up in absolute terms, but it's just supposedly going to fall. Well, that's only possible if we have households borrowing at exceptional levels and the corporate sector borrowing at exceptional levels, meaning that effectively the government doesn't have to instead. I don't believe any of it. I don't believe that's going to happen. So at its core, there is here a spending plan and a projection for the next few years, which to me looks like, well, a myth made up rubbish if you want to be really polite impolite i could be worse but i won't well you know this is a public service broadcast <laughs> so we're not going to be that rude but the point is this is technically frankly completely deeply flawed and we have seen warnings for years now that that households are uh, getting themselves into unsustainable levels of debt so asking yeah, them to agree. borrow even more it's setting up for a failure Look, the thing that we can afford to have in this country is government debt. The thing we can't afford to have in this country in particular is significant household debt. Households, some households, of course, are incredibly rich. That's fine. Very fortunate for them. Most are not. Most actually live pretty perilously in the sense that they can very often not make it to the end of the month or whenever their next can be paid without sometimes dipping into a loan. Now, for those households, we know that there is, you know, frankly real risk in any economic downturn and i think we're going to see more households in that dangerous level of debt um and governments can always pay their debts well a government like the uk's can and the government of scotland could when we get it and when it has its own currency because they can create their own money that's the great advantage of being a government but households can't create their own money. Well, they can, but nobody will accept it. So, you know, in effect, they can't. Or you go to jail for trying. No, you can try, <laughs> but to see if you can get anyone to accept your um, Scottish pound note and then, you know, and see if anybody buys it. They won't because it's yours and they don't believe you. So there's a fundamental difference. They're trying to force the debt onto the people who can't afford it instead of having it in the government, where, frankly, it's no risk at all to anyone. So... Diving into some of the, the specific policies, there's been a few that are already starting to make the headlines. One big controversial one, especially just four days before COP26 starts, is the, uh, the, the cut to air passenger duty for domestic flights. I was simply staggered by this. I have to admit, I doubt if there was anybody in the House of Commons, anybody who was listening who expected this to happen. Uh, why on earth, before days or so before COP26, as he suddenly said, I'm going to make it cheaper to fly in the UK than to go by train? Why am I going to subsidise the most polluting form of transport that I can find in the UK and not help out the less polluting form? I mean, just amazing. Um, so naive, so stupid, unbelievable. But I also noticed, I think we took to 35 minutes during this statement before we actually heard the words green or in, you know, climate or environment mentioned. It was so low in his list of priorities that we you know, really had to work hard to find when it came. And when it did come, it was this absurd announcement, disastrous for the UK's position at COP26. Yeah, I mean, this is something that I studied a few years ago when the Scottish government were planning a, a, a similar uh, cut to air passenger duty and found that essentially, yes, it, it, it cuts your ticket price, but it doesn't really do much for, um, for a lot of passengers, because uh, a lot of passengers don't really fly based on that pricing. No, uh, they don't. Not, certainly not no. at that edge. Um, it, it, it's a certainly, tiny... It's a part of the cost of the flight. But frankly, all they're doing is comparing the cost of flying to the cost of rail or driving their car, or they're doing it for convenience and time. So it doesn't have a very significant impact on pricing. It's very sticky in that sense. So it, but it is nonetheless 
sending all the wrong signals. Precisely. But we also heard, you know, just before uh, the announcement, we heard Boris Johnson playing stupid politics with Labour, who happened today to be represented by Ed Miliband at Prime Minister's Question Time, and he really knows his environment stuff. Give him his credit on that. And he was playing Boris Johnson all over the place. And Boris Johnson was saying, oh, Labour will allow you one flight every five years and they will take your car away in 2030. I mean, if the government plays at such stupid levels of misinformation, not surprising that they can also do something as ill-informed as this change to air passenger duty, yeah. Yeah, and even even playing Labour at their, their own game and the policy side of things, because we also saw the universal credit um, uh, get get adjusted today, uh, nicking Labour's policy of, of reducing the, cred, the universal credit taper rate. This is the, the rate at which the credit is withdrawn as you earn money. Um, it used to be, it's currently set at 63%, um, it's now going to get reduced to 55%. Um, but let's be clear about what that means. People who actually do come off universal credit because they are moving on to dependence on paid employment actually have the highest overall tax rates in the UK economy. Yes. So tax rates, which, according to the Tories, would drive every wealthy person out of the UK, leave them to flee to go to a tax haven, are apparently perfectly OK if suffered by people in Glasgow, Edinburgh, Dundee, Aberdeen, Inverness and beyond. You know, those things are fine, apparently, for those who are on low pay, who are just making men's meet. And let's also be clear, what this actually does mean, this taper, mm -hmm. even though it's been reduced to 55%, whilst the Tories are saying they're going to increase the living wage to £9.50, and they say that's going to increase average earnings for people in that situation by £1,000 a year, and in theory it does, for many of those people, they'll also be on living wage if they're on. Um, many of the people on living wage are also on universal credit because it's very hard to live on 15 or so thousand a year. Yeah. And as a consequence, they're going to see a great deal of that money go straight back to the government by taper, even if it's 55 percent plus tax and national insurance. We're going to be seeing the most phenomenal withdrawal of money from these people. And this is therefore not a substitute, although again, Lucy Fraser tried to claim it was, for the £20 a week loss of universal credit that has just happened, which was tax-free. So we are talking about an absurd comparison here. This is not a generous um, delivery by them. I, I, they've come up with some example where they claim people are better off. Well, that's ignoring the fact they've just taken 20 quid away from them for a start. I mean, let's be blunt, their starting point is, oh, you've already lost 20 quid a week, you're now better off. Yeah, well... <laughs> Let's talk about where you were in September, not in October, and then you discover you're not better off. But overall, this is a really mean budget for people on low incomes. Yeah, and it's important to note that if you're not working at all, if universal credit is your sole income, then the taper, taper rate reduction does absolutely nothing for you. No, three million people on universal credit will actually have no benefit from this, apparently. I mean, that's my overall expectation. Can I mention another thing that's going to hit a lot of households really hard that happened today, which is not theoretically within the control, of course, of Rishi Sunak, which is he gave the clearest possible hint that he has written to the Bank of England to tell them it is their job to control inflation. Now, we know that inflation is rising at the moment. According to the Office for Budget Responsibility, this is going to be a blip. It's going to be over by February. Within nine, ten months, it will have fallen out of the statistics. However, it was very clear he was saying to the Bank of England, please increase interest rates. Now, interest rates are probably going to rise, according to the Office for Budget Responsibility, from 0.1% base rate now to 0.75% interest rate. Now, I'm old enough to remember when imagining an interest rate of 0.75% would have been, well, literally unimaginable. Um, I can remember a base rate of 15%. So, you know, why am I complaining? Well, I'm complaining because actually 40% of people with mortgages now have never known what it's really like to see base rates increase significantly. And many of them will actually be budgeted to their limits because that's where house prices are. And they're going to be under real stress, therefore, to make payments when this change, which is forecast to be effectively permanent by the Office for Budget Responsibility, feeds through into their mortgage rate whenever it is. People, of course, who've got other borrowings, you know, unsecured household borrowings, which again are very common, um, we've already discussed, you know, these people being vulnerable, those people are going to see this rate come through quicker into the amount they're going to be paying on their bills. So we're seeing another hit to what are effectively the most stressed households, those who are in debt. 
I mean, just added up and everything about this budget is bad news for those who really need help in the Scottish economy. Yeah, it'll certainly be interesting to see how the spread of various interest rates changes. If the base rate goes up to 0.75, you can guarantee that credit card rates will go up by somewhat more than that. Somewhat more, yes, absolutely. Yeah. So um, you mentioned the lack of green ambition in this, and one thing that I particularly noted was you have countries now, especially with COP coming up, starting to look at various environmental taxes. The EU is now diving headlong into the very radical world of carbon border taxes and other environmental adjustment taxes. None of that mentioned in the budget. Nor can I find it in any of the budget documents at all. There doesn't appear to be anything going on here that I can discover. Um, it appears that they are simply ignoring this issue for now. Again, they think that they've published their net zero strategy there doesn't appear to be any desire to translate that into something more serious in terms of budget proposals as yet. Um, again, just staggering that just before the COP, just before when we're meant to be leading the world, this is not being said. Um, nor is there any real indication, I mean, because we've just had um, the announcement, okay, of a green guilt by um, the government, which, you know, Rishi Sunak loves to applaud himself on, but frankly, so what? He raised 10 billion of money. He didn't need to call it guilt to borrow 10 billion of money, and we don't know what he's going to use it for. So whether this is green borrowing or not is a very good question, because it's not clear why he's going to use that 10 billion pounds and what on. But I've been proposing for some time that there should actually be a green ISA. Um, and paying a rate equivalent to the gilt rate, which is what the government borrows on from the commercial markets, something like 1%. I believe that would have attracted hordes of money into funding for the Green New Deal that we know we need to pay for the transition, which COP26 is all about. Instead, this last week, we got an extremely mean account from the National Savings and Investments, NSNI, paying 0.65%, which is not very competitive, and you have to lock your money up for three years to get that quite low rate now for that length of time. Mm. So there's no indication that right across the board, Rishi Sunak is interested in using the financial tools he's got available to him in the Treasury to deliver the climate change demands that are obviously having to be met. It's as if they don't realise that we've got to harm, harm emissions this decade to meet our targets. You know, it's just well, one of those things, they can't be bothered with that. There's always something else. And one of the persistent indicators of that, again, was his emphasis upon growth, 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 as if the only thing that matters, the only thing that will drive his budget is growth. But he didn't talk about that being qualified in any way by the fact we must grow within the constraints of the planet, we must grow within the constraints of being sustainable. No, it was just undiluted growth that we heard. Again, deeply worrying to me yeah. in the light of what is coming and you know, the disaster that will happen if we pursue that policy forever. And I mean the word disaster seriously. That's what I now think. Yeah. It's worth saying, actually, that um, we've been calling for the Scottish National Investment Bank to get the powers to introduce a, a similar kind of green guilt um, for a while now. And we've we heard have. a few weeks ago that uh, the bank is now exploring options of, of, of gaining those powers. So it's going to be a, an interesting watch for a, a while to see if they if they get them. I'm delighted because I think that is really important. What I would love would be if actually it could not just get the borrowing powers, but could actually create the consumer saving opportunity so that people could literally become savers for the planet. Mm. To save the planet, you become a saver for the planet. Good slogan. I like it. Um, the last budget item I want to pick up um, from, from my end, uh, I'll, I'll let you pick your, your own favourites, uh, in a moment, Richard, but there was one line, and it wasn't from the budget itself, but it was from the OBR's response document, tucked away in page 100 and whatever. Um, a little line that you'll like, Richard, just admitting that free ports do absolutely nothing to boost an economy, they merely move it around. <laughs> but free ports are an opportunity for abuse around the world. They are most commonly associated with crime. I didn't say that. The OECD, um, the Organisation for Economic Cooperation and Development, which the UK belongs to, has said that. Um, it does not believe that they add to economic growth. They are tax-free havens, as we know. The UK government is trying to impose one on Scotland against Scotland's will, because Scotland wants to make them green if they're going to be a free port in Scotland, but the UK government says it won't do that. 
And all that free ports do at best is move jobs from outside the free port into the free port with less tax paid as a consequence. It's just a false narrative, but it fits terribly well with Rishi Sunak's Ayn Rand, let's free the economy from red tape narrative, even though there's no evidence that really delivers any benefit for anyone. All right. So is there anything else in the budget before we move on to COP that you'd like? Oh, to only to further to causes for despair. You know, one of the ones <laughs> I've just noticed, um, and literally just before um, we started recording this, I put up a blog noting that the government is saying that there's going to be £200 of quantitative easing reversed over the next six years. That's going to take £200 billion out of the economy, um, removing the effect that there has been over the last few years to compensate for you know, the downsides which have happened during two economic recessions, effectively, therefore deflating the economy at the same time. It's, it's very obvious that we're already, frankly, in my opinion, in such a perilous position that recession is the most likely thing to be happening next year. But they're apparently they're planning to take money back out as well. I mean, you couldn't write a script guaranteed to deliver recession better than the one that they're doing. Um, I mean, I'll mention my mate Danny Blanchflower here, who's um, an economist, um, obviously in the USA, but also uh, University of Glasgow. He and I call ourselves the Mile End Road economists. But the Mile End Road in London is one mile outside the city. And I assure you, it's very different from the city itself. If you know London, then you'll know that the Mile End Road is, well, yeah, a little different from the wealth of the city just one mile away. And so it's a different perspective. And that's the point we're making. You can find equivalent examples in Edinburgh, most certainly, and of course, in Glasgow, etc. The point is that actually Danny talks about doing the economics of walking about. You go and ask people what they think. And the evidence is that actually, if you ask ordinary people whether they think their economic uh, affairs, you know, well-being is increasing or decreasing, they are much better at forecasting what's going to happen in the economy than economists are. Um, economists look at the data and produce all sorts of you know, deep maths, which is sort of quite fun if you're a bit of a geek. And I've been known to do a bit of geeky maths in my time. Sorry, confession. But actually, ordinary people just sort of use the rule of thumb. And right now, people in the US are quite certain they're heading into recession. And people here are showing every sign of it. Let me give the clearest indication. Retail sales in the UK have fallen every month for the last five months, despite the claim that was made during the COVID lockdowns that there would be this most enormous boost after the release of lockdown. People would go out and spend again. They haven't been. Actually, surprisingly, after the initial boost, there's been declines. People are hoarding money. They're not spending money. They're actually thinking that we're heading for more trouble. I know Scotland has a much better COVID position than England at the moment, but England will drag Scotland down with it as sure as day follows night, because that's the way it always does. And I believe that we're heading for a, a, a real downturn. I think Rishi Sunak read every room wrong. I hope it's the end of his political career. I hope the Tories lose faith with him as a result. But, you know, that faith, that hope might be the one that's really misplaced in all this. So just because you've mentioned COVID there, that, that does kind of segue us into uh, this great international gathering that is coming to Scot uh, coming to Glasgow next week. The, 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 the First Minister has admitted will inevitably drive up COVID numbers in Glasgow. Should COP be going ahead during a pandemic? Well, COP should be going ahead. We can't afford to not have COP. The question is, should we have a virtual COP? Um, for two reasons. One, frankly, and let's be honest, although you know, Scotland is doing better than the rest of the UK, it is undoubtedly going to give a serious COVID boost. You know, we've seen mass spreader events across the UK as a whole of over the summer. This is going to be a mass spreader event. A lot of people are going to get COVID. And frankly, people are going to die as a consequence of COP26. Now, to me, that's a price too much, um, let alone the long COVID implications as well. It, this could be done virtually, and that would send out another signal which is actually, as I've learned quite heavily over the last two years, I mean, I hate to tell you how many flights I did between 2016 and 2019, because I was coordinating research at seven universities across Europe um, on issues that I was involved with. So I was moving a lot, far too much for comfort. Um, actually, then you then discover you don't need to do that. You can just turn on Zoom um, and it will work just as well. We don't need to have everyone at the 
one venue to achieve this, certainly not 30,000 people. So, frankly, if COP26 was to go ahead, it should be much smaller or it could all be done from a distance. So, yeah, we need COP26. Do we need this COP26? I doubt it. Mm -hmm. I should say Commonwealth got, uh, has got status uh, as an official observer for COP. We have tickets to be in, in the room where it all happens, but I'm not quite sure yet just how engaged we're going to be. I'm certainly not entirely keen on walking into that, that pandemic-filled room myself. So, well, I've had um, COVID, yeah. and I know what it feels like to have COVID on your chest, because I did, and thankfully it went away. I wouldn't want to go there again. Um, I would not take that risk. And I've got double jab, but now really, frankly, I'm pretty much out of the protection. I'm waiting for a booster. Would I therefore be coming to Glasgow? I'm afraid not. I wouldn't do it, even though I had the invitation. Yeah, I caught it just a couple of days before the first lockdown back in March 2020. Um, I got it at the same again, time. Yeah, again, I'm not keep, I, I had a close call a, a couple of months ago where I caught something that felt very similar, but all my tests came back negative. Um, yeah, I don't fancy going through round two with it. No. Um, but, my son has had it twice, by the way. Oh, it's just as bad the second time. Yeah. Oh. So on COP, we have seen some of the countries around the world come out with uh, various net zero plans. Uh, the UK, as you mentioned earlier, came out with it. I critiqued it last week on the Commonwealth newsletter, pointing out that a net zero is very different from a Green New Deal because you can decarbonise an economy and still leave people in a, in a, in a really bad hole. Um, what, what's your thoughts on some of, the, some of the net zero plans that have come out? So My fast. big concern about many of the net zero plans I see from governments and from large companies, and let's be clear, we actually need both to have these commitments, is that they are, well, a bit like Rishi Sunak's budget, really. They are built upon false promises. The big one is that we will have technologies that can deliver, in particular, carbon capture and offset, carbon capture and storage. And that therefore means that we can keep on producing carbon, but we can just pump it into somewhere where it will either be stored or that carbon will find an alternative use. Although no one really knows what that alternative use is as yet, um, given the amount of carbon that we will need to actually capture and store. So whilst I know that people tell me that we will get technologies that will deliver the these versions of net zero plans i remain deeply skeptical i would much prefer that we saw very clear indications that these net zero plans are predicated upon certain clear assumptions including that there will be sufficient investment to create certain technologies and i would much rather see a much wider range of technologies than those we're currently talking about um, to achieve the plan um, by a certain date and that if we haven't made progress on one technology by a certain date there is a backup plan so i personally I'm completely unconvinced that we can keep producing carbon to the extent that we are. Again, methane is a massive risk and we know it. So we should instead be talking about fundamentally different issues. We should be talking about actually reducing energy consumption. And far too few of these net zero plans discuss that issue. Far too few of them discuss issues, for example, about turning houses into power stations, which I know we've discussed before. And I know that Commonweal is very good on. You have one of the best Green New Deal documents that you, your plan that I've ever seen. And I still you know, applaud you for it. Um, we are not seeing a sufficient discussion about literally the micro level of how we make houses energy efficient. Yeah. How we and there is another fundamental assumption is we won't have to change our lifestyles. Most of these net zero plans assume we'll do everything the same. You know, Boris Johnson thinks we will fly as much as we do. Now he forgets the fact that 50% of most countries, even a country like Scotland, almost never fly. Um, yep. If he gets that 15% of people do the vast majority of flying, and in fact, even inside that 15%, 5% do most of it. And by the way, they're not business people. They're those who've got second homes outside the UK. They really, really burn the air mass. So, but he assumes that we can carry on doing all that. I don't. I don't think we can do the same. 
I don't think we'll have the same giant cars that we have now. And remember, cars now are giant. I remember my fa father's first car bought in 1964, if I remember correctly. I was six. And it was tiny by the standards of the cars we have now, even the small cars we have now. It was minute. It was a BMC 1100, Austin 1100. <laughs> get in those and you'll realize just how damn small they were but we now drive tanks around the world we can't do that so there are so many changes and we have to change our agriculture and again there's not enough of that net zero planning the change of the fact we're going to have to eat less meat i'm not yet a vegetarian i'm getting pretty close um i don't know whether i'll ever become a vegan but i'm you know we're having to change our thinking my household has changed its thinking about meat. we no longer eat any red meat um, if we have meat, it's not red meat. You know, we have fundamentally changed our thinking to try to become or have a lower carbon imprint. And I think that that's just not in these plans. So they really worry me. The underlying assumption is everything can carry on as normal and we can do a bit of tinkering on the side. There is no tinkering on the side that will solve anything for our future. We have to have fundamental change. It doesn't mean to say life will be bad. Life might actually be better. And it does mean to say that in some ways we won't have growth. Because um, I do actually think there are some types of growth we can have. There is no limit to the amount we can care for each other. There's no limit to the amount we can educate each other. There's no limit to the number of songs we can sing each other to each other. Now, when I look at the good things in life, most of the good things in life that I enjoy, and again, I may be a bit odd, I may be a bit green, I don't know. But most of the things that I enjoy in life, like my family, like going for walks, like meeting a friend you know, in a pub, which is half mile down the road, um, and actually drinking beer, which actually does not produce vast amounts of carbon, thank God. Um, you know, those things are actually pretty low carbon activities. We have to work out what is valuable to us. Most of these net zero plans haven't worked that out. So we're a long way from really having the true Green New Deal, new thinking, new way of living, but which is sustainable, which is necessary. COP26 is therefore not really delivering all I hope for. I know it can't. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm still not sure which is the, the more brazen of the net zero plans I've read, was it, whether it was Australia's, yes, we'll stop mining coal, but we won't tell you when, or Saudi Arabia's, no, we're just not going to stop drilling oil. We'll be net zero in everything but oil. <laughs> Yeah. I mean, this is astonishing that there are countries who are just so blatant. I mean, I mean, frankly, I mean, it is astonishing that Greta Thunberg can outthink all these people uh, with one simple comment. You just go blah, blah, blah. She actually literally neutered the lot. Um, it was a, it's so clever on her part. Um, and I, I just wish I had that skill to find three words which would actually silence um, so many governments, because these governments are talking, well, not just blah, 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 but something worse. Yeah. So if you were the person at the head of the table over the next couple of weeks, you had the power just to bash all the heads into shape. What would uh, an ideal COP agreement actually look like to you? Oh, an ideal COP agreement would actually, in a sense, reshape some of the previous agreements because it would demand that countries actually say not just how they're going to cut their emissions, but how they're going to cut their total energy use. So we're not just talking about substituting green for carbon produced energy. We're talking about how can you produce less? Because to me, that is the most critical change that so far people haven't got their head around. Um, and which has the biggest potential source of change there is. And that is going to affect lifestyles. As I said, you know, each house or most houses, I don't say each house because that's not true. Most houses have two fundamental, you know, carbon emitting boilers, engines inside their households. One is a gas boiler and the other is their car. Now, if they haven't got a car, they've got halfway to improving things. The other one is what they buy in and consume. Um, so those are the three things they can do. We need to consume better and wiser, which may be less, but we will, as I just said, do more services, which actually keep us happier. And we will at the same time need to actually seriously cut 
our carbon consumption, our energy consumption, as a total energy consumption, to make sure that we don't even need to build as much green energy capacity. Because remember, green energy capacity does also create carbon output <laughs> at the moment, because we're using steel and we're using concrete and all sorts of stuff to build some of those installations. So my desire for COP is to actually send everyone away to redo their homework to come back with net zero plans, which don't just say how I'll offset what I'm already doing, but how I'll fundamentally change what I'm doing so that we really produce much less and then work from that basis as to how we can achieve the transformation that we want. That countries haven't got anything like far enough in their thinking as yet to manage that stage of development. So last question, now that we've got that high point, that ideal, putting your cynical hat back on, what do you think, COP will actually achieve over the next two weeks. And given the failure of countries to meet the promises that they laid out in Paris and in Copenhagen before that, um, what do you think they'll actually achieve um, based on those promises? Well, we have to factor in here that if you were to choose any politician in the world to head COP, it wouldn't be Boris Johnson. Um, so has the UK got the negotiating ability to actually force people who aren't too willing to comply to actually do so. And there are tales of you know, previous COPs and other equivalent deals where you know, the prime minister of the host nation has basically nailed the prime minister of another country to the wall and said, you're not leaving that wall until you've agreed to do what I want. Um, you can't imagine that actually Boris Johnson could even say that sentence without a abusing somebody physically which is obviously not what we intend and b coherently tell them what he does want so i'm kind of worried about the simple fact that i don't think we have the ability to reach a cop deal so i don't think the capacity exists in the uk to drive it to an agreement my great fear is that we will see the world divide into camps at cop those who are saying, yeah, we'll do this anyway, those will say, well, we can't do it because China and India aren't, so what's the point of us doing it? And we hear that so commonly already. Yeah. Um, and we'll have one or two who will just be saying, but you're killing us and you know that. Well, more than one or two, because obviously quite a number of countries are in that situation. So I fear that we'll end up with actually a more divided rather than a less divided world after COP precisely because the ability to draw India, Australia, China, Saudi Arabia, um, and some others to the table, Russia, and get agreement um, of any sort will prevent us actually even producing the platform for the next round. Remember, we've been here before, we had Copenhagen, when was it, 2009? Um, which was a pretty disastrous um, attempt at a deal then. We did get Paris, um, and that was amazing. We got Paris, but at the moment, my fear is division and breakdown. At the moment when we simply can't afford it, and that's the price we pay for having Boris Johnson in charge. A good, I do I think a good prime minister could have negotiated the deal here? Um, yeah, I do, actually. I think it wouldn't have been a great deal, but there would have been a deal at the moment. I'm not even sure we'll get that. And my fear is effectively, therefore... Um, environment competition will actually be on the table um, and company and countries will be competing and companies will exploit it. I'm talking about something very similar to tax competition, which I've seen over the last 20 years and commented on far too much, um, you know, where countries competed to basically get to the worst possible standard. I fear that if yeah. we don't get to a less common denominator agreement here, mm -hmm. we can actually see some countries actually competing to come to the lowest standard they can to attract inward investment. And that could really undermine our hopes and literally our chances of survival. It's as blunt as that. And yet they don't seem to get it. I'm really worried. Me too. <laughs> Quite frankly, I couldn't have put it better myself. Um, just as we come to the end of this now, Richard, thank you for coming on to the podcast. Uh, wish it could have been slightly cheerier, but we'll get you on another time for that. Uh, <laughs> we'll do a cheerier one on another day. Sorry, folks, but um, we're talking serious stuff here. It's a yes. shame that we really are talking you know, major issues for the planet, for our countries, everything else. Yeah. So, well, we'll make sure we get a good story next time you're on. 
Thank you again. And thank you, everyone else uh, who's, who's listening in, who's sharing the podcast, who's commenting about it. Just a reminder, as I always do, that Commonweal is an organisation that is funded entirely by you, by, by all of you listening out there, who, who gives us a regular donation of an average of £10 a month. If there's anyone out there who wants to contribute to Commonweal to help us produce this podcast and produce the policy work we're doing and produce stuff like the Green New Deal plan that, that Richard mentioned during this show, then we gratefully accept any of those donations. We don't get government money. We don't have corporate money. We don't have the fossil fuel industry lavishing us with greenwash money. Uh, not that we would accept it, even if they offered. Um, so we are entire, rel entirely reliant on our supporters. Um, so thank you again for a, a very interesting podcast. Thank you, Richard. And I'll see you all next week. Thank you.